Today's lecture consists of chapters 26 and 27 in two pieces, as well as one or more matching quizzes, which will be sent under separate cover by email. This is the beginning of a series on forms of doing business, notwithstanding the fact that COVID-19 has pretty much shut down most small businesses in America. They will be back. And the simplest form of doing business, of course, is a sole proprietorship. They have lumped together franchises in this chapter for reasons that are beyond me, but we'll go over that as well. Now let's talk for a second about the concept of the entrepreneur. That's someone who initiates and assumes the financial risk of a new business enterprise and undertakes to provide or control its management. One or more entrepreneurs setting out to start a business should consider the following factors when deciding what form of business to organize. The ease and expense of creation, the owner's liability for the entity's obligations, tax considerations, and the need and ability to raise capital. As always, we have learning objectives. What advantages and disadvantages are associated with the sole partnership? What are the basic requirements of the franchise rule and why? What might happen if a franchisor exercises too much control over the operations of a franchise? When will a court decide that a franchisor has wrongfully terminated a franchise? Sole proprietorships are the simplest form of business organization because the owner is the business. The owner reports business income on his or her personal income tax return, generally speaking on a Schedule C attached to the return, and is legally responsible for all of the debts and obligations that are incurred by the business, since they are, in fact, simply personal debts and obligations. The advantages are that proprietorship is extremely easy and inexpensive to form. Uh, you really don't have to do anything. Uh, the proprietor receives all of the profits. The proprietor pays only personal income taxes on the business's profits. And the owner has flexibility and full control over business decisions, since obviously they are the business. The disadvantages are also the fact that they are the business. The proprietor has unlimited liability for any losses or liabilities incurred by the entity, is thus putting his or her personal assets uh, at risk. The entity will not survive the proprietor's death, disability, or retirement. And the proprietor may only raise capital for the business out of his personal funds and from loans others are willing to make based on his personal liability and the factors that we just talked about. In addition to that, um, the tax situation is not necessarily advantageous since uh, the profits of the business um, are ordinarily also going to be subject to payroll taxes as well as income taxes in this form of doing business. And once again, to a certain extent, I got ahead of myself. Disadvantages are that the sole proprietor bears the burden of any losses in the business. Uh, personal assets are all at risk. Subject, of course, to things like state-created um, uh, homestead exemptions, which, of course, we talked about at least briefly in the context of bankruptcy. Um, per creditors can go after all of those assets, uh, with the exception of things like homestead. Uh, there's a lack of continuity if the owner dies. In particular, uh, there's no ability for the personal representative or heirs to just pick up and continue. There has to be some kind of process involved that um, really isn't there in the case of a sole proprietorship. 
and there is a limited ability to raise capital because of those risk factors. Now, as I say, we're going to talk about franchises briefly. Uh, that's a relationship where the owner of a trademark, trade name, or copyright, you know, recall those are all forms of intellectual property, is the franchisor, and they allow another person or entity, known as the franchisee, to use that trademark, trade name, or copyright under specified conditions or subject to particular limitations in selling goods or services. There's several types of franchises. First, there's a distributorship, a relationship where a manufacturer, who's the franchisor, licenses one or more dealers, the franchisees, to sell the manufacturer's product. A second type of franchise is a chain style operation, a relationship where the franchisee operates under the franchisor's trade name and is identified as a member of a select group of dealers that engages in the franchisor's business. Most McDonald's restaurants, for instance, are conducted in this way, a franchisor-franchisee relationship. Finally, there's a manufacturing or processing plant, a relationship where the franchisor transmits to the franchisee essential ingredients or the specifications to make a particular product, which the franchisee will then market at the wholesale or retail level in accordance with the franchisor's standards. Uh, an example of that um, would be a Coca-Cola or Pepsi bottling plant where the franchisee owns the plant and may actually be manufacturing more than one kind of beverage. Uh, they might be making products for more than one um, soda uh, franchisor. Because a franchise relationship is primarily a contractual relationship, state contract laws govern most aspects of the franchise relationship. In addition, federal uh, statutes govern particular types of franchises or aspects of franchising. Uh, typically because um, franchising is a form of investment. For example, the Automobile Dealers Franchise Act protects automobile dealership franchisees whose franchisors impose unreasonable demands and then terminate the franchise because of the dealer's failure to satisfy them. And in other words, they're basically setting up the franchisee to fail. Uh, more generally, the Federal Trade Commission's franchise rule requires franchisors to disclose material facts that a prospective franchisee needs in order to make an informed decision whether or not to purchase a franchise. Again, these are similar to the kind of blue sky laws that regulate the sales of securities. Uh, because once again, uh, people are probably making a substantial six or seven figure investment uh, into uh, virtually any franchise. Many states have franchise statutes and regulations that tend to mimic the federal franchise statutes and regulations. A number of states have laws similar to the federal rules requiring franchisors to provide pre-sale disclosures to prospective franchisees and to prevent arbitrary or bad faith terminations by franchisors State law may prohibit termination without good cause or require that certain procedures be followed in terminating a franchising relationship. Here's a handy exhibit uh, going over the FTC's franchise rule requirements. Uh, you'll notice there are specific requirements regarding written disclosures. Uh, such as a range of goods and services, including um, the value and estimated profitability of the franchise, 
Um, these can be delivered on paper or, or electronically. So once again, I mean, there's no guarantee that the, the prospective franchisee will actually read these disclosures, but they're made. A uh, reasonable basis for any representations is required, so that um, at the time that they're made, the representations made to a prospective franchisee must have a reasonable basis. Right now, I would think there are a number of franchises that would be virtually impossible to sell simply because uh, representations made about their potential profitability in light of the current emergency would be very, very difficult to estimate. Uh, projected earnings figures, uh, same thing. You can be based on actual data or hypothetical examples. Um, franchise rule, rule doesn't require uh, anybody to actually give potential earnings figures, but if they are going to, then they can be one or, one or both of those. Uh, actual data uh, also has to be disclosed um, regarding the number and percentage of existing franchises that achieve whatever results they're uh, attempting to tell you as a prospective franchisee you might be able to um, obtain. And franchisors are required to explain termination, cancellation, renewal provisions of the franchise contract to their potential franchisees before the agreement is signed. Since a franchise is ordinarily for a term of years, um, if you're going to go ahead and build an entire restaurant, you want to know that it's going to be something you can look forward to renew when the time comes. Franchise contracts typically, I might say, um, are the size of a book. Um, paying for the franchise. The franchisee typically pays an initial fee or a lump sum price for the franchise license, separate and apart from the cost of any equipment and products the franchisee purchases from the franchisor. Uh, in most cases, the franchisee will also pay the franchisor a percentage of annual sales and quite often will contribute to advertising and administrative costs of the franchisor. You may have a requirement that you utilize certain materials that are provided by the franchise or um, in the case of restaurants, you may have to purchase your branded products from the franchise or uh, in addition to having to pay a percentage of your gross um, to the franchise or in other cases, say um, a franchise that consists of a gym, um, you may probably will be required to buy your equipment from your franchisor, um, but there may be much more lax requirements regarding um, membership, or there may be very strict requirements as to membership, as is in the case of, uh, say, the Orange Theory chain. Um, the business premises, the contracts didn't specify whether you uh, can lease, must lease, or must purchase, uh, what you have to do in terms of the build out. Um, it's going to require the layout of uh, the particular franchise. Um, the territory, in the case of distributorships especially, um, a distributor is not allowed to go and attempt to sell product beyond the geographic location that they're, they're in. Uh, in the case of something like McDonald's, obviously, you know, people are coming to it. Uh, although lately, if you add in uh, the potential for delivery, um, you are probably going to wind up with territorial issues if they're not already covered by the franchise contract, which I strongly suspect they already would be. Quality control. The franchisor may establish and enforce certain quality standards in order to protect its reputation. Um, not just may, uh, almost invariably they're going to do it. Um, pricing arrangements. Franchisor can only suggest the price at which its franchisees will sell its product, but it may require franchisees to purchase its supplies at established prices. Finally, 
in this extremely short half lecture. We have franchise termination. Most franchise agreements specify their duration subject to a renewal if both franchisor and franchisee agree to renew and on the terms of a renewal. Termination is, generally speaking, um, only for cause if it takes place before the end of the stated duration of the franchise agreement. Uh, for example, a death or disability of the franchisee, bankruptcy or insolvency of the franchisee, breach of the franchise agreement, uh, and even then only with prior notice being given to the franchisee to give them an opportunity uh, to cure. Uh, if the franchise agreement does not set a minimum period for notice prior to termination, then the franchisor must give the franchisee reasonable notice of its intent to terminate the franchisee. Franchisor may also give the franchisee an opportunity to cure a breach before termination. Uh, wrongful termination um, comes up under circumstances where a franchisee makes a substantial investment to use but not own. Uh, the trademark, trade name, etc. And um, while they've acted in good faith, um, the franchisor is not acting in good faith um, in its attempts to terminate the franchisee. Franchisor always has an obligation to act both in good faith and um, to deal fairly with a franchisee in, a, in the context of an attempt to terminate the franchise. And that's going to conclude this portion.